سلام علیکم سلام بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم All praises are Allah's Lord of the worlds and may his peace and blessings be upon our master the holy prophet Muhammad and his pure immaculate ahlul bayt Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajal I would also like to thank all those who have persevered through these last few nights. I'd also like to thank the Misghali household for their hospitality during the last few nights, few days. All of Yasin's active members for all the efforts they've put to make this program work. And also to brothers Ali Akbar, Yahya and Muhammad Ismail for providing such an intense environment after the talks. Okay. So, we started off by saying that our origins, our destination, our potential is the same, be you a man or a woman. The essence of what you are, be you a man or a woman, is your spirit, your immaterial spirit. We said sex, i.e. being male or being female, we said sex is secondary to what you are in essence. Primarily, you are an immaterial spirit. That's your essence. Sex is something secondary to what you are. Because we said being male or being female is a function of your physical anatomy. And that's why in Barzakh, in Qiyama, assuming we believe that these realms of existences are immaterial, there's no sex in this, though. Male and female have no meaning as they do in this world. A brother asked me to speak about hijab last night. He just wanted me to, only for a few minutes, out of respect for this brother. If, with your permission, I'll just speak only two or three minutes. Hijab requires much more. But with this introduction, I'll introduce hijab in this way, that with hijab, you see, your essence, we said, is the spirit. It's sexless. Being male or female has nothing to do with the essence of what you are. Being male or female, being female, in the case of women with hijab, being female, is removed when you wear the hijab in society. That element which is secondary to your existence is being removed when you wear the hijab in society. And by wearing the hijab, you are the free spirit that constitutes your essence. But when you go home with your mahrams, there it's the animal you, the animal you, I mean, the female comes out when you remove the hijab. And that's okay in a confined environment with mahrams to, to um, express that female side. But when it comes to society, we have to all be that essence of what we are, not the animal you anymore. And that's one of the Irfani explanations of the hijab. Okay, let's go back to where we left last night. The Holy Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, said, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjal fajr. Hubbiba ilayya min dunyakum thalath. Made made love to me in your world of three things. 
three things have been made to be loved. Made love to me in your world. Women and Nesar, Atib, Jo'ila Gurrata Aini as Salat. So one women, one was a pleasant aroma, and the third was Salat, which is the comfort of my eyes. There are three things here. Women and perfume have been employed horizontally to Salat. Salat has a celestial potential for every one of us. When we see women and perfume being used horizontally to Salat, we shouldn't take the animalistic interpretation. There's more deeper layers involved here. And we explained why women have been used horizontal to Salat. We said woman, through her manifestations of Allah's attributes, manifestations which men can't express, one was that of divine beauty, one was that of her nurturing, her rububiyya, her being a manifestation of rab. Men can be manifestations too, but not to the same extent as women. That's why women have been assigned as a source of love for the Holy Prophet and should be assigned a source of love for us. That's where we left off last night. Now, as to the secret of why women have been made to be loved, it says, Hubbe ba ilayya. Three things have been made to be loved by, for me. It doesn't say, I love three things. These three things have been made to be loved. As to why this should be, Ibn Arab here has given two reasons. He says, first of all, since whatever manifests more divine attributes manifests Allah more. That's on, on one hand. On the other hand, women manifest Allah's attributes more than men, especially in those attributes of beauty and rububiyya, being rab. And then in his reasoning, he says this, that man and woman, they're both creation and created. They created beings, created past participle. It has the dimension of reception and acceptance to it. They, they both are creation. But with women, in addition to this, she's a manifestation of divine action and influence. And it's this that men don't have. I'll explain that in a minute. There's a action aspect, an influencing aspect that women have, where they lure the opposite sex, they lure the man, attract the man to themselves, and make them love women. If you remember the important tradition in the second lecture, when Prophet Adam on seeing Eve for the first time, it caused a source of affinity for Adam He was lured, attracted. Now there was no sexual animalistic attraction at that first time. He wasn't even aware of that at that time, the sexual attraction. This was much more important. This was a divine attraction. On seeing Eve, if you recall the tradition, he was pulled towards her. Eve pulled Adam to her creation, pulled Adam towards her. It's this manifestation of divine action and of influence that women have. In addition to being creation, she has this added element. Now, this will be explained later on. So, by 
by seeing if in chapter 30, 21, I'll first read the verse, and of his signs is that he, Allah, created for you mates from your own constitution, so that you may take comfort in them, in your mates, so you can take comfort in them. And then he assigned affection and mercy between you. Now, the aim of this assigned affection, which Allah has assigned between man and woman, is to acquire comfort. But what does this comfort entail? Imam Sadiq, alayhi salam, in a very important tradition, says, Kullama izdad al-abdu imana Don't forget where we are. Man takes comfort in women. What does this comfort mean? Kullama izdad al-abdu imana izdad hubban lil-nisa Whenever love of women increases for man, their iman increases in proportion to that. Loving women leads to loving Allah more, an increase in faith. See, this is, these are all traditions here that the Urafa have been playing around with and extrapolating important information. You love women, as we've explained how we should love them, your faith increases. Your faith towards Allah. That divine comfort should be acquired. That's why your mates have been created for you from your own constitution, so that you take comfort in them. You acquire divine comfort through women, the output will be increase in faith and then we have other traditions which say the more you love women your love to us the Ahlul Bayt will increase you see these things have to be explored in detail so this comfort which is mentioned in the verse is a function of the heart and this love which Imam Sadiq mentions in the tradition, it can't be an animalistic love. Whoever loves women animalistically, the more you do that, the more your faith in Allah increases. It can't be that. Women as manifestations of a strong level, degree, in Allah's rububiyya and Allah's beauty, they can be the conduit to Allah for people. Otherwise, this the latter love, this animalistic love, that's only a temporary, short-lived. By no means does it make one reach Allah. That's a temporary thing, a transient thing. So the Imam is referring to a divine and humane or human love towards women as manifestations of Allah's attributes. And that's why sometimes we see, some men may feel that when they are separated from their wives, they feel a kind of vacuum or emptiness. Their salat isn't the salat when they were under the same roof with their wives. I mean, when I personally, when I come and do tablir, it's not as strong, but in Iran with my wife, Whenever she goes to her parents and I'm in Rome, that vacuum, I feel it very strongly. It, it happens. One's ibadat isn't the same exactly. To support this, we have traditions again. One prophetic tradition states, Ma ohibbo, I don't like. Were the world and everything in it to be mine, 
wa inni whilst wa inni battu laylatan wa laysat li zawja I don't like that even if all the world and everything in it were to be mine I don't want it I don't like it if it means that I spend I sleep the night without my spouse you see this can't be animalistic now that's the last thing you should be thinking of where else has the prophet said where else do you, do you recall him saying if you give all the world to me what don't i reject islam is islam here too one night i'm not ready to compromise one night with my wife with whatever you want to give these are important is it the animal woman that he's seeing here of course it's not and this is for people to benefit from was he is masum of the highest degree but the we we have to really benefit and use this our take on women has to change min akhlaq al anbiya hubb an nisa Loving women is amongst the traits of the prophets. Here too, loving women spiritually, how we've explained that love which leads to Allah, that love which leads to that divine comfort. That's what the prophets love. That's why an Irfani explanation of why homosexuality. is prohibited okay we have traditions in the quran the sharia clearly says no homosexual but on a irfani level how they explain it is this that a man and a man the man has no conduit to allah through another man he can do it through himself man arafa nafsa arafa rabba but he can't do it he can't elevate through another man it has to be through a woman because the woman has manifestations of those specific attributes which no other man has by nature we can take that one step high even if you're a man and you you're married you have a wife and you keep on if you just pay attention to this i don't want you to get the wrong message here you're a man you're married and you ignore your wife and you keep on going out with other men either socializing or in the pretense that you want to learn more or be a better person that in quotes is homosexual behavior in an irfani sense think about it just think about it a bit so loving women is amongst the prophetic traits now don't say but prophet jesus didn't marry why not why didn't he marry then if it's a very important trait the answer to that is marrying is a tool okay if it was vital for everyone's spiritual wayfaring it would have been made wajib at the outset it's a tool to attain to allah permanent marriage is a t- the ticket to allah the aim of permanently marrying is purely divine now jesus and his son was ruhullah the spirit of allah He didn't need that. He had reached that peak of his. There was no further level there. He was ruh Allah. There was no woman to marry maybe. But in any case he didn't need that for that attainment to Allah. It wasn't necessary. Lady Maryam didn't marry. 
She was masoom, pure. There were many instances like this in previous Sharia's. In the Sharia of the Holy Prophet, though, things are different a bit. But even in the Sharia of the Holy Prophet, Lady Fatima, alayhi salam, if there wasn't a person whose ismat was of a higher degree, she wouldn't have married. It had to be Amir al Mu'minin for her to marry. There are many other external responsibilities which he had to marry. That's another separate equation. But Lady Fatima, it had to be Ali, alayhi salam. Lady Maryam, no, she was just from the very beginning, she was untouched. Mary would give, she would acquire nothing through marrying. Hazrat Ma'sume in Rum, the sister of Imam Radha, alayhi salam, she was unmarried. There was no man for her. So these things you have to. Now, the late Sheikh Mutahari has said that the male has been created, the male, as a manifestation of seeking loving and requesting whereas the woman has been assigned as one who is sought one who is loved one who is requested see the difference here and then he adds in quotes the woman is the flower whilst the man is the nightingale who is pulling who who is attracting who the woman has been assigned as the candle and the man the butterfly. Need and want has been made instinct in one, which is the man, need, he's needy. Whereas being coy and manifesting has been assigned in the other. One is doing the action of alluring, influencing. The other is in need. Okay, so in short, we've said that the woman's been created by Allah to be loved and the love to give has been incorporated within the man. And loving the Lord and loving women are both manifestations of one reality, but their degrees differ. One is a conduit to another. What does that mean? Loving the woman who is a manifestation of divine beauty is a route to loving the creator of women who is pure and absolute beauty per se. Okay. Now, continuing from that Ibn Arabi's theory, that in addition to being creation, the woman is a manifestation of divine action and influence. Molavi, Rumi, has gone one step ahead even. He described women in one of his poems. And this is an incredible poem, how he's explained this. And uh, it was shown to me by one of my ustads. And um, I'll go through the poem and then we'll go slowly into the interpretation. But this is one of those important points. It's what Ibn Ariel also said. It shows that you know, the Orafa are uniform in what they believe in relation to women. So, in this poem we see that he's describing women as a manifestation of Allah's agency. for Fa'iliyah. Okay? Man is on the receiving end. But the agent is the woman. Being a manifestation of Allah's agency. You know, pulling the man towards herself. I'll read the Farsi too, although my Farsi is not as good, but maybe there are some people who in these four lectures have been here and have understood no English, at least they can understand this Farsi poem. I'll do it verse by couplet by couplet. Goft Peyrambar Kezan Bar Agelan Galib Ayat Sacht Vabar Sahib Delan the Prophet has said that the woman, and this is my very weak translation of difficult poem. The Prophet has said that the woman predominates firmly over the rational 
and the spiritual people. Boz bar zan jahilan qalib shavand kandarishan tundi hayvan ast band. And over the women, it is the ignorant that dominates, as if within them is the harshness of animals. Kam bovad shan rqato lutfo vedad, zan ke hayvani ist qalib bar nehad. There is little smoothness, compassion, and love from one whose inside. Bestiality rules. Mehru rqat vasf insani bovad. Khashm u shahwat vasf hayvani bovad. Mercy and smoothness are attributes of humans. Anger and lust are attributes of animals. Partov haq ast an. Ma'shoog nist. خالق است آن گویا مخلوق نیست Women are manifestations of the truth not loved ones It is as if they are creators not created ones So here, first of all Mawlavi here is referring to a prophetic tradition and in this tradition although this Tradition, its authenticity has been questioned by the Fogaha, but its meaning, though, can be extrapolated from the logic of revelation and the principles of Irfan. We can get this meaning, but the tradition per se is problematic. The tradition is this that the Holy Prophet has said, Inna hunna yaglibna <laughs> Women predominate over rational people. And predominating over them, predominating over women, are the ignorant. The first two couplets of Moulavi was in ref reference to this. That in relation to the spiritual people, the rational people, women predominate over them. But it's the ignorant men who predominate over women. Now the secret and logic behind the first two couplets, right, the fact that the rational, the spiritual are predominated and the ignorant are domineering over the women is that those who are rational, those who are spiritual, they've distanced themselves from animalistic behavior. They don't let anger and lust govern themselves. Their spirituality allows them to see the truth of the woman, sees beauty and rubu, be a lordship of the woman. They let the woman be. It's as if they're being predominated by the woman, by letting the woman be. Whereas the ignorant, animalistic, lustful man who has no idea of spirituality, yes, their take on the woman is different. They don't see Allah, the woman. And they say, do this, do that, do this, do that. They shout, do this, yes. Some people even treat women like animals. It's very important. So it's a very delicate point that Mulavi has raised here. Those who are spiritual, those who are rational, who through the woman, through her nurturing capacity, through her beauty, inner and outer, reach Allah, you can't compare these people to those who see the woman merely as an animal. Any compassion they show to the woman is only in the bedroom or the kitchen. These are two different classes of people. And then, in the last couplet, he 
refers to women as subjects that manifest the agency and creatorship of Allah. Women are manifestations of truth, not loved ones. It is as if they are creators, not created ones. That create that agency of Allah, that creatorship of Allah he's referring to now. Because they are pulling the man towards herself. For him to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So instead of only saying that women are not man's loved ones, they are. But in addition to that, he's saying they are rays of divine beauty manifesting creatorship within the frame of a created body. That's what they're manifesting. Now sometimes we see and hear of ulama attributing all their success to women. For example, Allah Metabotaboi has said all my success is because of my wife. Now this isn't because the wife cooks and cleans. Of course he wouldn't say that. He wouldn't mean that. In his seeing Allah, the presence of his wife facilitated that. That's what they mean. Now, Allah Metabotamu's wife was a very holy woman. And this would help. But even if the woman is not holy, and actually it's the opposite, it's not even religious, the Urafos still elevate through her. You see, there's a story in relation to Hazrat Nuh alayhi salam, where they go to, um, a few men go to the house, house and knock on the door, the wife comes out. They say, where is his eminency, the grand messenger of Allah? The wife said, these terms, I don't know what, who you're referring to or what you want. Being very rude to his husband. But if you want my husband, that man is, you know, in the jungle there. You see, he, she wasn't very, she didn't observe the proper etiquette. Anyway, when they went to find Prophet Noah, he came on a lion towards the people. The lion was very tame. And they asked him, Good grief, that's a lion, aren't you scared? How can you have any control over it? And he said, didn't you knock on my door first? Similar stories amongst the ulama too, like Bo Yazid Bastami, a similar event, where they knocked on his door and the wife swore behind, his, behind her husband, saying, oh, why do you want my... X, Y, Z husband. And then the people, they were shocked. And then he also, they say, he came on a lion. And when he was asked how, he said, by seeing a law through that woman who cursed me. Just because the woman isn't religious though, if, if they are religious, okay, it's easier. But even if they're not religious, you have to work with her. In any case, you have to see those, she has those manifestations, or be they potential. You have to be patient. Let her be. Now, there's another important tradition. Just before this mentioning it, I just have to give one or two preliminary remarks here. We have a tradition that says, it's a Hadith al Qudsi sacred tradition, where Allah says, I created all things for man, and I created man for myself. Similar tradition in relation to the, specifically in relation to the Holy Prophet, but we have other traditions in relation to man in general. All things have been created for man, man and woman to elevate towards Allah. All things want to become human. The peak, the peak 
the maximum that all things have is to become human. Now, what do I mean by human? Earth becoming human, apples becoming human, food, drink, the sun, moon. Their maximum is when they become human. But what do I mean by that? You look at the earth, for example, how it becomes plants, a tree, and then apples are grown, then you eat the apple. When you eat the apple, that apple is now finished. It's become part of you, the human. All things are for the benefit of humans. Once one of my ustads went to Ayatollah Hassan Zadeh's house with a group of people. And uh, they were students of Ayatollah Hassan Zadeh. And then he put some apples in front of them. And then went to the kitchen. And when he came back, he saw that no one is touching these apples. On seeing that, he said, why aren't you eating these apples? These apples too want to become la ilaha illallah. Because man becomes Allah-like. Everything else wants to become human. These apples too want to become la ilaha illallah. Because once it becomes part of man, when he eats it, ingests it, man in one's ascension to Allah, that apple too has participated. See how delicate he's put these very important. So, now in existence, if you imagine all of existence as, you know, everything that is as a tree of existence, the fruit of this tree is people or people. And the, the fruit of fruits is the perfect person. But people in general is the product of existence. Everything is in relation to building people. And this was just an introduction to, um, I want to slowly enter the hadith. When everything is created for people, and people have been created for Allah, so that people acquire that unity with Allah, now we begin to understand the importance of and appreciate the role that the women have, especially, first of all, in the first nine months. It's as if it's a factory of producing Allah's goods here. No other thing has that. So first we appreciate that role, the role of the womb of the woman. Because it all starts there. And Solomon starts in the womb. Without the womb, there wouldn't have been mankind. Now, pay attention on this very important hadith. It's a hadith of Qudsi also, and it emphasizes the essential significance of the womb. Allah says, Ana Allah, I am Allah. Wa Ana Rahman, and I am Rahman. Khalaqtur Rahima. I created the womb. Wa shaqaqatu laha isman min ismi. And I derived it from a name amongst my names. Rahman. Rahim is the womb. It is the womb has been derived and is a manifestation of the attribute Rahman. Waman wasalaha wasaltuhu. Whoever unites with it, the womb, will you, I will unite with them. Waman qata'aha qata'tuhu. And whoever breaks away from the womb, I shall break away from him. Look at the importance of the womb here. First of all, Rahman means universally merciful. When we say Bismillah rahman rahim Rahman universally merciful. Rahim specifically merciful. But here, the Rahim 
is a manifestation of this universal mercy. And this is explicit in the tradition here. In addition to this, one is prescribed to unite oneself with it, with the womb, and never break away from it. Now this has many meanings now. The, the tradition is clear. The Orafa are using this tradition and a number of different meanings emanate from it. Now, first of all, this order to unite and the prohibition to disconnect with the womb, first of all, it stresses the importance of the womb. But in relation to the meanings, the first meaning the scholars have extracted is that this uniting with the womb and not breaking away from it is the command to execute Salatul Rahim, maintaining family relations. One of the most important ethical obligations. Breaking away, from, breaking family relations is haram. Although maintaining family relations depends on the family, how you should treat your maternal aunt in your own orf, one expects more maintenance of relations than with your second cousin, for example. Each to their own degree. But if you break away, you break this family relationship, it's haram. Here, we're enjoined to maintain family relations with those whom we share a common womb. It doesn't say maintain relationship with your friends. It's those who you share a common womb with. Now in fiqh they do demarcate a certain boundary of who Silatul Rahim is applicable to. In a book called Lum'a, I've read that many years ago, I think it's up to the second cousin even. They're even included in it. But I'm not positive. But it's not only the aunts and uncles, parents and grandparents. It's more extensive than that. The second meaning extracted from the Rahmaniyya of the womb is during the nine months of gestation. Okay, the womb is extracted from Rahman. The womb is a manifestation of Rahman. The possessor of the womb is a manifestation of this attribute of Allah, Rahman. And this is very expressed during the nine months of gestation, where we see and observe nine months of the mother's complete display of universal mercy to the potential child. It's from the womb where the tradition, the tradition says that heaven lies under the mother's feet. It's from the womb that this tradition starts to actualize. I think I mentioned yesterday or the day before that many people believe that the owner of the womb is the genetic mother. Not merely the owner of the ovum. Uh, now in the West they're, they're speaking of ectogenetic machines. And that's where they, they, they're considering a technology in the future that once you put the embryo in a machine or device of some sort, the whole nine months the child will grow in that ectogenetic machine. Although I've spoken with many specialists in this field in Iran, they say it's impossible, but let's imagine it becomes possible. There's nothing wrong if it were to happen. But if this does happen, that child will be motherless, according to these scholars, who believe the mother of the child is the owner of the womb. That, that nurturing capacity in the what mother is through that womb, that she's a manifestation of Allah's Rahmaniya. So this mercy from day one in the womb is laying the foundations of that child's heaven. But the Orafa said there's another womb too. 
we have another womb. One is the womb, the physical womb, the uterus. They also call the second womb the world, nature, the natural cosmos. Ibn Fanori has. He's a very important RF. He has many important books. In one of them, he describes that the world is a womb too. And once again, look at the mother's role in the world, displaying that universal mercy to the child. Because it's after birth, the child grows, and during those early years, again, we see the mother nurturing, providing all that mercy, which is irreplaceable. It's secondary to none. You can't replace it with anything else. So the mother's nurturing capacity here, we see in two different wombs. It's not only the womb in nine months, but even in this world, it continues, especially during the early years. Her breastfeeding, nursing, sleepless nights, these all emanate from Allah's Rahmaniya. She's a strong manifestation of Allah's Rahmania. A Rahmania which men can't disclose as easier. And it's here that one encounters incredible traditions which sometimes it's very difficult to understand. That a single sigh of the woman during labor can't be compensated for. These are very important. A single sigh, never mind all the things that she's done. We do have some traditions where, which are saying that if you do want to compensate, the closest thing you can do to compensate for her is assuming she's in severe debt, you relieving her of that severe debt is a very, very precious thing to do. But it will never compensate for it. And it's based on these traditions that Imam Khomeini, and I'll end with this statement of his. Now, you should now really understand this wholeheartedly after these four lectures, what Imam wants to say. He says, the value of a single night of the mother. Now, Imam was a faqih, he was a philosopher, jurisprudent, ethicist, arif. He still has very important marginal notes of the most difficult Irfani books. They haven't been published, some of them yet. Because some of them are so deep that it's too early to put it out for the common lay people. He is saying this, the value of a single night of the mother with the child surpasses years of the responsible father's efforts. Here's someone who's understood what being a woman is all about. Surpasses years of the responsible father's efforts, a single night of the woman. The embodiment of affection and mercy in the mother's luminous outlook is the manifestation of the mercy and affection of the Lord of all worlds, Rabbul Alameen. The Almighty Allah has blended the mother's heart and soul with the light of mercy of Allah's Lordship to the extent that it can't be identified anywhere save within the mother. You see, you can't find that logic anywhere except in the mother. And he, Allah, has granted this eternal mercy to them for their heaven-breaking burdens from the time of conception, during gestation, during labor, birth, and so on. Then Imam adds, the noble tradition that reads heaven lies under the mother's feet is referring to a reality. Such delicate wording is emphasizing the mightiness of the matter 
as well as warning children. Now, this is the important part. As well as warning children of the fact that they, children, should seek prosperity and heaven from beneath their mother's feet. What does it mean, beneath the mother's feet? And that they should observe their sanctity as they observe Allah's. And that they should seek their immaculate Lord's satisfaction through the satisfaction of their mothers. This is Irfan. This is spirituality. If you see a few Arifs abusing the whole thing, don't think Irfan is bad. It's all based on traditions. This is a faqih, an arif speaking. Okay, the Sharia says that don't do bad to your parents, like speak loudly, swearing, or doing things which that orf regards as bad. Making them upset, angry. Okay, sometimes they become upset by you choosing a subject. That's, you're not doing bad to them. They're being upset. The Sharia doesn't call that at all. That's the Sharia though. If you go, want to go higher, if you want to act according to ethical and erfani in that realm, you seek Allah's satisfaction in absolute terms through your mother's satisfaction. The father too, but the mother much more. Be a slave to her. It's very difficult. You'll fall sometime. It's not haram though, but if you really want to elevate, this is the key to spiritual wayfaring. If your mother's, if, you, if, if you're living with a mother, make the most of it. Husbands who have a wife, that wife is a mother too. If your mother's alive, make the most of it. If your mother's passed away, according to the traditions, make the most of it. See, these are important realities we have to act upon. I'll end there. Thank you for being very patient. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.